Good afternoon and welcome to Saturday Scholars. I'm Peter Holland, I'm the Associate Dean for the Arts uh, and it's my responsibility and pleasure to organise and introduce our speakers at Saturday Scholars. And I'm glad that some of you decided that this might be just a bit more interesting than the mob on Library Quad catching the end of College Game Day. Uh, I'm just going to mention the upcoming events. Uh, next week, again, when we play Brigham Young, uh, Jessica Payne, uh, who is an assistant professor in psychology and director of the Sleep, Stress and Memory Lab, you can choose which of those you seem to do without, uh, is giving a, a, a talk called Sleep on It, There's More to It Than Just the Old Adage. At the Pit Game on the 3rd of November, Brad Gregory of the Department of History will be talking about the unintended reformation how a religious reformation, a revolution secularized society. And for our final home game of the season, the Wake Forest game on the 17th of November, Mark Roach will be talking about, or asking rather, what's so funny about a joke? Today's speaker is Susan Omer, who is my colleague in the Department of Film, Television and Theatre. Uh, Susan is the William and Helen Kuhn Carey Associate Professor of Modern Communication in the department. Uh, as usual, every four years, she's teaching a class this semester on media and presidential elections. Uh, and guess what? It's a class that is always heavily oversubscribed. Um, and it will be look at, that class looks at the roles that print, broadcast, and digital media have played in our national elections. Her own research work uh, led to a, a, a brilliant book on George Gallup in Hollywood. Who knew, I certainly didn't, that Gallup uh, worked as a pollster for the, the film studios to try to gauge audience responses to the movies, uh, and Susan located in the archives vast quantities of material relating to that and wrote this extraordinarily interesting book about the process by which uh, Gallup was working to try to define what kinds of movies the film studios should be making. One of the other things that she finds time for, and I never quite understand how she finds time for everything else, uh, is that she is the uh, academic advisor to the Notre Dame debate team. And two weeks ago, uh, the team hosted a national tournament in collaboration with the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Learning Center in California. She's also the head of a new initiative on campus called Digital ND, which is looking at our use of digital media across campus. And therefore, if anything goes wrong with her presentation, she only has herself to blame. <laughs> her topic today is presidential campaign commercials from I Like Ike to today. Susan Elmer. Thank you very much, Peter. And Peter has hit on something important, which I will describe to you while I'm Mike. And that is that when there is anything digital connected with your name, you better get your technology right. So I will only blame myself and not the wonderful assistance that I've had today in setting this up. How is the sound working for you now? Is it good? Excellent. A little louder. All right, my wonderful assistance back there. Can we take it up a little? Okay, Mark will. Great, thank you. Um, our, our uh, discussion today is going to focus on campaign commercials. And you might be thinking, haven't we seen enough? Because depending on what part of the country you live in, you probably have seen more than enough. Now, just focusing on the presidential election, because we're all being inundated with commercials from local elections, how many people think I've had enough already when it comes to those presidential commercials? Okay, <laughs> what states are you in, those of you who think that you've had enough already? Ohio, I sympathize. I'm a, Cincinnati, I'm a Cincinnati native, I totally understand where you're at. Is there anybody here from Florida? Okay, you've got it the worst. Um, if you want empirical proof, and we like that, of just how bad you have it in your state, I wanted to share with you this wonderful um, campaign ad tracker from the Washington Post. I love it because it's what they call interactive. You can move your cursor over the map and it will tell you how much is being spent in your city. Now what's interesting about this map is how many parts of the United States 
are not getting a lot of campaign commercials, which means, of course, that the funds are being concentrated in a smaller number of states. And our gentleman from Ohio has proof of why he's feeling the way he does, because Ohio is number three when it comes to top campaign spending. Florida, Virginia, Ohio, and North Carolina. What I love about this, if we look at my home state of Ohio, we can see that, let's see, Dayton's getting nine million, Columbus is getting 19 million, Cincinnati, my hometown, has 35 million. So this is something that illustrates one of the trends in campaign commercials in um, this election, which is the micro-targeting, very specific targeting of very specific communities. And that map, I think, provides a brilliant illustration of how this is working. So you might say, all right, I'm seeing enough of these campaign commercials. Why would I want to see any more? And so I would like to persuade you about why <coughs> we might like to see them. And you may remember this famous commercial from um, one of President Reagan's elections, The Bear. What I would argue today about campaign commercials is that they are mini masterpieces. I really do believe that. They are masterpieces of persuasion. They combine sound and images in very creative ways to persuade us of something. Sometimes, as we'll see, it's didactic. The meaning is not too hard to figure out. At other times, the meaning is much more subtle. Sometimes the commercials persuade us without using any sounds or any words at all. Um, at other times, they lean very heavily on the visuals. But often, it's in the juxtaposition of the two. Another reason why political commercials are so persuasive is how compressed they are. In 30 seconds, they communicate vast amounts of meaning, as we'll see with the Bear commercial, so that you don't need an hour to make your point the way the debates do. Commercials can convey a multiplicity of meanings in just a few seconds. And then finally, I think commercials are significant because every in them is carefully selected. It is there for a reason. Commercials do not leave anything to chance. They are carefully crafted advertisements, persuasive advertisements. And so because they're so compressed, because they use sound and images in very creative ways, I would argue that they're worth our attention, and that is why I'm grateful um, that you're here today to talk about them with me. Now, a wonderful example of, of compression that opens up a range of meanings without even looking like it is this famous bear commercial. I use a lot of commercials from YouTube because it's so easy to access. There is a bear in the woods. For some people, the bear is easy to see. Others don't see it at all. Some people say the bear is tame. Others say it's vicious and dangerous. Since no one can really be sure who's right, isn't it smart to be as strong as the bear? If there is a bear. <laughs> now, other than this last image here, what tells us that that is not a National Geographic spot? The footage could be. It's a bear wandering around the woods, looking kind of lost, looking kind of ominous because it's a big bear. If anybody follows Stephen Colbert, you know the thing that he has about bears, so this would frighten some people very much. Why isn't this a National Geographic special? What is it about this? Yes. Exactly. The voiceover is, is deep. You, you find yourself wanting to imitate the voiceover in these things. It's deep. There's a bear in the woods. And anybody, if you just heard that, I'd be nervous just hearing that. Where? Where's the bear? What woods? All right, so the voiceover is menacing. Tone of voice is very important. That's something we'll see in many of these commercials. What about the choice of words? Does he ever identify what the bear is? It's just a bear. But why is it menacing? Why, does, why do we think to ourselves there's something more than a nature film going on here? I like to talk back and forth, so you just go right ahead. The music, yes, thump. Thump, thump, mimicking your heartbeat, perhaps, as you listen to this thump, thump. But also, he's talking about the bear. Should 
we be concerned? Shouldn't we be prepared? Some people don't think there's a bear there. Now, when you're looking at that bear, to hear this menacing voice say, some people don't think there's a bear there, when it's right in front of your face, that leads you to think, who are those people who don't seem to understand what's right in front of their face? But of course, we know, looking back on the 1980s, what is this bear referring to? Russia, exactly. Our students don't know that. <laughs> this is part of the educational environment, is recreating for them the context. It's fascinating to teach commercials from another time to um, our students today because they don't have the framework that, that we have. And it's nice to be in the room with other people who remember these things, may I say. That is not the case when we're teaching. And sometimes I feel very old, um, as we all do, in front of our students. But exactly, we know because we bring that context to it at the time, but also now because we're old enough to remember it, that this commercial is evoking the menace of the Soviet Union. And because it comes to back to President Reagan at the end, links him to people or to the belief that there's a bear in the woods, that the bear is dangerous, and that we have to be on guard to be prepared to do something about the bear. This is a brilliant example of the very subtle use of sound and image that doesn't even refer overtly to politics until the very last frame with Ronald Reagan, but awakens a sense of ominous dread, both through the visuals and through the choice of the words. Now, let's see. We're going to go back to, there's a little back and forth. Now, I'm going to stop that. We need all hundred of our senators to be as conscientious as Richard is. Even YouTube has ads now. Okay, there we go. All right. Now, we take it for granted that commercials like the one we just saw are about 30 seconds to one minute. But in fact, this is something that goes back to the 1950s. Now, I've seen this up here. There it is. The commercials that we see today that are 30 seconds or one minute are called spot commercials. They're very short. They're very compact. But in the 1950s, when television commercials first began to appear, there was a lot of discussion about what should they look like. Um, how can we most effectively use this medium? Um, you may not remember, um, or you may, that the 1950s, the decade in which television moved into the American home, it's estimated that in 1950 there were about 4 million TV sets in American homes. By 1952, the first presidential election with Dwight Eisenhower, it is estimated that there were 16 million television sets in American homes. And by 1956, the second election with Dwight Eisenhower, it's estimated that there were about 40 million TV sets in American homes. So you have a dramatic movement, of this new technological medium, into a domestic environment. And there was a great deal of discussion about what this meant for the family, what this meant for politics, how politicians could work effectively with this medium. And they realized pretty quickly that since television was an advertising-based medium, there was an opportunity here to advertise a candidate. But there was still a lot of discussion about how to do that. Adley Stevenson, um, a very intelligent, thoughtful person who believed in the power of reasoned arguments, felt that the best way to promote his candidacy was to rent one-hour chunks of time and talk. Now we call that a debate, and usually there's some back and forth. But Eisenhower's team, which involved a number of advertising executives from Madison Avenue, thought that the best way to persuade people was not to talk, not even necessarily to use a reason, but to use the same kind of strategies that worked in advertising consumer products. Eisenhower worked with an advertising executive named Rossa Reeves, and his papers are at the University of Wisconsin. And Reeves was very matter of fact. He said, politicians can be advertised in exactly the way we advertise toothpaste. When it comes to commercials, there's no difference. So he felt we should use some of the same strategies that were so effective in commercials at that time. One strategy was the jingle, a catchy musical phrase that would stick in your mind. And I will warn you now that the one we're about to see will stick in your mind. You will be at the stadium, and you'll be hearing this. And another strategy that was very popular at the time was animation. 
uh, the 1950s in part because of the popularity of television, feature film production began to decline. It wasn't only due to TV, but, but that was one of the reasons. And it even affected studios like Disney. So some of Disney's animators and other animators went to work in advertising. And some of the Disney animators actually did the animation footage for this Eisenhower cartoon. So you have a, a situation with this cartoon that has nothing to do with argument or reasons or here are my five points or five plans. It works on a completely different level. So as we look at this cartoon, we want to think about how it uses screen movement. What direction are they moving in and what does this tell us? But also, what types of people do you see? This is a commercial that makes a very simple point in a very catchy way that really has nothing to do with the specific issues of the campaign, but it is considered one of the all-time classic campaign commercials. And I will admit it's one of my personal favorites, so that's another reason why we're, we're looking at it. Get ready for this jingle. And you'll see a number of sites that feature commercials. Okay. No rally bees. I'm for president. I'm for president. I'm for president. I'm for president. You like that? I like that. Everybody likes that. I'm for president. I got the better piece of gum. We'll take that to Washington. We don't want John. not forget that. I'm just, I'm just warning you, you will not forget that. But, oh, I absolutely love that. My students come back five years after graduation and say they still hear, I like Ike. So it does stay with you. So what direction are they moving in? Right. Now that may have a political significance. It's more likely because we read right to left and so your eye is going to move in that direction. But that certainly conveys a sense of unity and purpose and people marching together happily, bouncing up and down, following Uncle Sam and following Ike. What sorts of people did you notice in this? You got it. We're talking bandwagon. We see a, a, a cook. We see a business person. We see a homemaker. We see a cowboy, farmers, fire engines, different kinds of workers. Many different kinds of people are happily following behind Ike. How do we know they're happy about this? <laughs> There's, I just, you just have to imitate this. I just feel like bouncing up and down after I hear this commercial. They're happy. They're singing. I like Ike. Talk about a simple message. It is one of the slogans that has endured for more than 50 years. I like Ike. It's fortunate that Ike is part of the word like, and so you can sort of blend them together that way. But we're talking, let's see, eight letters, three words, and yet it's pithy. It's to the point. It has nothing about here's why I like Ike. Here are the reasons in his platform why I like Ike. It's just about, I like Ike. And this was um, a significant change in thinking about political commercials of the 1950s. This is not about persuasive arguments. This is not about, here are the five reasons why. This is emotion. This is fun. This is jingle. It's something catchy that works on your subconscious. Very different from Adlai Stevenson talking for an hour without, without end. Ike's advertising experts bought time at the end of the most popular TV shows in the 1950s to run this commercial so it would be connected um, with them in people's minds. But even though it looks fun and delightful and popular, that is not to say that it wasn't carefully planned. One of the qualities that's unusual about this commercial is that it was storyboarded. Many of you know that when films are produced, they are worked out on paper through drawings and then the dialogue that goes with the drawings. This is especially true of cartoons. Um, Disney storyboards are sold now 
Um, and they are the ones that are transferred into cells to create the animation. But it's also true of live action films. And these are some of the storyboards from Ross and Reeves' collection in Wisconsin, um, where you can see images and the dialogue that comes with them. So this is what they would do for the commercials. Now I want to show you the one commercial that goes with this. The sort of happy jingle uh, was a key development of the 50s. But one of the things that was true of Eisenhower's um, campaign is that they were working out different strategies. They didn't always go with the happy jingle. Another particular favorite um, is a series called Eisenhower Answers America. And you will really hear the voice on this one. Um, and I'm going to leave it on this side. America. General, the Democrats are telling me I never had it so good. Can that be true when America is billions in debt? Prices have doubled, and taxes break our backs, and we are still fighting in Korea? It's tragic, and it's time for a change. Now that was 20 seconds. <laughs> These commercials were made all at once in New York City using tourists from Radio City um, as a stand-ins, and they all have the same structure. Um, they were each focused around one particular issue. Um, this one was, it's time for a change. And you have the voter, in this case an African-American man, which was unusual, looking screen right, as if he were talking to Eisenhower off camera. And then Eisenhower looks screen left, as if he were talking back to the voter. In, he's very, he's very uh, formal, he's in a suit, he's very stern. Um, and then he barks out, um, what's wrong with America today? Again, no discussion of policy or here's what I would change. Just this is well, some of the things that are wrong and this is why we need to make a change. This is 20 seconds of very didactic, hammer at home commercial. Nothing subtle about it. But there was a whole series of these for the Eisenhower campaign. So you can see how in the 50s, and the Eisenhower campaign exemplifies it, advertisers and politicians were experimenting with different kinds of styles of commercial. We have the very didactic one that we just saw, and we also have the happy jingle um, that we saw before. Now, in the 60s, you start to get some other developments in terms of the visuals. And that is illustrated in a very interesting commercial that John Kennedy used in the 1960 election. This is interesting because it exemplifies something that you see in political commercials and also in inaugural addresses, that candidates from one party will often borrow a good strategy from the candidates of another party from a previous election. In my class, the students read a number of, of inaugural addresses. Um, we tailor the class so that we move in sync with the election process. So after the election, we look at the process of inauguration and we analyze inaugural addresses. And one thing that often surprises the students is how many presidents go back to John Kennedy's 1961 speech, the New Frontier speech. George Bush, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, people you might not think would refer back to it, refer back to that speech. It's it become a real touchstone. And that is also true of this commercial. This is a commercial that builds on I Like Ike. You will see some signs that look hand-drawn. You will see signs that say Kennedy, Kennedy, Kennedy. This has a jingle um, attached to it. It also introduces something new, and that is the use of photographs which is something, is a feature of many commercials in the 1960s, and we'll see it in some of the commercials with Richard Nixon. Um, so we want to think about how this both borrows from the Eisenhower I Like I commercial, but introduces new elements, in particular in the photographs of the kind of people that are involved in this commercial. It's a much broader range of human beings than we saw in the Eisenhower commercial. So let's look at this. This is also a very memorable jingle. If I like Ike doesn't stick in your mind, this probably will, so. <laughs> Seem familiar? <laughs> Do you like a man who answers great? A man who's 
I know. If, if I could take us back to that photograph, I would. It's a beautiful photograph. And that illustrates how effectively the Kennedy campaign used photography and images of his family. It's something that my students respond to very much when they see it. So I think we can see the parallels with the Eisenhower jingle, and that you see um, signs that say Kennedy as opposed to I like Ike. Um, there is a general direction moving to screen right. But what are some of the differences in terms of the kinds of people we see in this commercial? <laughs> African Americans, old people, poor people, people um, dressed in different ways, people who clearly illustrate different occupations and different ethnicities as well. Um, there's even a Star of David in there as a reference to Israel, which is not something you ever would have seen um, in Eisenhower's commercials. One reason for that is because of the prominence of civil rights as an election issue in 1960. And those of you who remember it, if you go back and look at the newspapers and press coverage of the time, know that it nearly ripped the party apart and that that was one of the reasons why Kennedy picked LBJ as his running mate um, to appeal to the South um, and also the Southwest. What's interesting about this juxtaposition of Kennedy and Eleanor Roosevelt is that she was one of the people who really pushed him to become more engaged with civil rights. He wanted her endorsement because one of the strategies of his campaign was to link his running back to FDR's 14-year, uh, or 12-year one, rather. And in order to get her endorsement, she wouldn't do it unless he came out much more firmly in favor of civil rights. So that's something that is, is played up very prominently in the commercial. But it's, it's a throwback to the 50s in some ways because of the jingle, because of the the semi-animated signs, the repetition of the name, but it looks ahead to some of the social issues um, that were coming ahead in the 1960s. Now, I think another example of how social issues play out in more subtle ways is that, that one of the famous ads, we could not really talk about commercials without looking at this one, even though it only ran once. Um, and so those of us who remember seeing it probably didn't see it when it ran. Um, it ran doing a, a semi-popular um, primetime show. But it was so notorious that the Democratic Party made a great show of withdrawing it. And that, of course, led to massive news coverage on Huntley Brinkley and on other evening news shows, where they, of course, replayed the commercial as part of the news story. So it's a very good example of something that Gallup talked about in the 1940s, of the difference between advertising and publicity. Advertising, he said, was, was cost, it cost money, publicity was free. So this got a lot of publicity and the Democratic Party didn't necessarily have to pay for it. Now this is a famous ad because it appeals to any adult's desire to protect children. And it also makes effective use of the tendency of children to, to mess things up in little ways that are absolutely delightful to us. And in this case, um, it features a little girl named Monique um, who's counting um, the petals on a daisy, and she flubs it. Um, and of course, we as parents know what it means for children to count, and we help them learn to count, and we teach them their numbers. So you're sort of holding your breath, will she get her numbers? Um, and then she doesn't quite, but her charming inability as yet to get her numbers in order is contrasted with the Voice of God narration who presents a different kind of countdown. So we'll listen to that and then think about the um, juxtaposition of the appeals and also the voice of LBJ. I'm very interested in hearing your thoughts about that, which comes in at the end.
Now, we talk about choices that we have now, but there's a choice for you. We either must love each other or die. Those are, those are your options. And given the two, I think we know which option we would pick. Um, now, this was a beautiful example, like the bear example, of not mentioning your opponent at all. Goldwater's name is not mentioned in this. You wouldn't necessarily know it was a presidential election, except that this is when the commercial aired. But just that image of the bomb, like the voiceover about the bear and the music, is enough to awaken um, a great deal of anxiety in people. And so to have that image appear in the pupil of a little girl um, stresses as dramatically as one can the juxtaposition of the horror of nuclear war and the innocence of that little child. What I find particularly impressive about the commercial and memorable is the juxtaposition of the voices, that sweet little voice flubbing her numbers with the very firm and clear countdown where nobody's going to mess up those numbers because we know exactly what that means. One of the things that puzzles me, and I have not been able to, um, to understand it even after doing some research, is the, the voice and the narration of LBJ at the end. Not only that we must love each other or die, it's a reference to a poem by W.H. Auden, um, September 1st, 1939, that he wrote when he was in New York, read a poem in Poland. Um, and it's not quite the identical line as the poem, but that's clearly the reference to it. And the poem talks a lot about childhood and preserving the world for the innocence of childhood. So this is a commercial that, if you're an English major, um, is making a link between nuclear war and World War II, which, of course, is where the, when the bomb was developed. So there's a lot of associations and links in there, which you may or may not follow, depending upon um, which of these uh, references triggers an association for you. But it is certainly going to trigger a very visceral desire to protect that little girl from the horrors of the bomb that many people in 1964 who were adults would have remembered. So I think that commercial is, is famous because of the stark juxtaposition of that little girl and the bomb, and also because of the narration at the end, basically giving us this blunt choice of loving each other or dying. Now, this use of juxtaposition of sound and image, in this case, is something that is picked up and repeated throughout the rest of the 1960s. There was a very interesting set of political commercials in 1968 that Joe McGinnis talks about in his book on the selling of the president. It's a wonderful, wonderful analysis of that election and the role of media in that election. Nixon hired a still photographer named Eugene Jones who won a number of photographic awards in the 1960s. And Jones believed that one could convey meaning in significant ways purely through juxtaposition, through the art of montage, um, juxtaposing one image um, right next to another. And this is a belief that photographers and filmmakers have explored since the 1920s. Much of the early writing about cinema um, looks at the different elements of film and how they can create meaning both within a single image and through an accumulation of images. So some of the most brilliant theoretical writing in cinema history is about editing and the power of juxtaposition through editing. And Jones was very familiar with that theoretical writing about the power of montage and the power of editing, and he brought that to bear on these commercials. This is a famous commercial called Convention, and it's an illustration of synergy in that Jones said, in his view, it demonstrated how the whole can be more than the sum of its parts. It's fascinating stylistically because there's no voiceover in contrast to the commercials that we've just seen. There's no human being narrating it. There is sound, but for the most part, the meaning arises through the juxtaposition of one image and another and the images and the sound. So let's look, about, or look at this and think about the conclusions um, that one would reach or that you remember reaching in 1968. Never has so much military, economic, and diplomatic power been used so ineffectively as in Vietnam. If after all of this time and all of this sacrifice and all of this support, 
there is still no end in sight. Then I say the time has come for the American people to turn to new leadership, not tied to the policies and mistakes of the past. I pledge to you, we shall have an honorable end to the war in Vietnam. Sorry, I give you that great lead up, and then there is voice over there, isn't it? This is another one of Eugene Jones' This time, though. vote like your whole world depended on it. And this is um, famous as well because of the private at the end whose actual name is Love. That's why um, it's on his helmet like that. Uh, people at the time thought it was a, a peace protest, but that was in fact his name. Here's the campaign um, commercial conventions that I mentioned. <laughs> in that there is no voiceover in that. But since some of us may remember what it refers to, where was that picture of Humphrey taken? 68 convention in Chicago, the very famous one where things got out of hand. It's fascinating to look at footage of that while the convention um, this year was going on. My students just were astounded to think that things could have gotten as chaotic as they did in Chicago. So Humphrey is, is at the podium at the convention. And the image is distorted and blurring back and forth um, to suggest perhaps that he doesn't have control, that he doesn't understand, that this is certainly not a stable environment. What's the music that we're hearing? <laughs> That's right. It's, there'll be a hot town in the old or time in the old town tonight. It's a very happy, upbeat convention song that does not at all go with those images of the young man um, laying wounded. Um, on the ground in Vietnam. So the juxtaposition of Humphrey in the image that's shaking in this very happy music with images of the war suggests that this is a party that doesn't get it, that isn't responsible, that doesn't understand it, that isn't taking charge. But none of that is said. This is why this commercial is such a beautiful illustration of the power of montage. We are busily making these connections. And we're working with the assumptions that we would have had from being there in 1968 and seeing the Vietnam War on television every night, the living room war, um, as it came to be known. But it is up to us to make those connections. The commercial doesn't make those connections for us. So it is a wonderful example of how meaning can be created without explicit didacticism, um, the way it was with the Eisenhower commercial. I have one more juxtaposition, and then we're going to look at a um, wrap-up of the commercial. Just came out last week. Um, this is a wonderful, wonderful comparison. I mentioned that I Like Ike is one of my personal favorites, but I think another one is Morning in America, the 1984 Reagan commercial, because it is as perfect as it gets as a symbolic representation in terms of the way it's done. Um, this is a commercial with a different kind of, of voiceover from what we've heard before. It's deliberately soothing. And the music is soothing. You want to be careful not to drop off to sleep. It is so soothing. It's comforting. It's a commercial that it, in its visual images picks just about every symbol of America except for apple pie. I don't think there's an apple pie in there, but we'll keep an eye out. And it kind of reminds us that this is what it can be like. Um, it is a commercial that embodies reassurance. So we'll look at that. It really is just beautifully done in terms of the way it's put together. And then we'll see what Bill Clinton did with it in 1992. It's morning again in America. 
I have to tell you, this is why I laugh when Peter said, when there's anything digital connected with your title. It's true. There's always something that happens. This is how it is when you teach film and television. But anyway, um, it has images of a picket fence, of the American flag, people going to church, people getting married, people driving cars, people in their homes, families with their children. They're almost all entirely white. I think there are two children who are Latino in there. But it's, it's definitely a very evocative image of American culture um, that just about anybody would want to live in. I mean, it's a fantasy of American culture, but, but it's still um, very reassuring for the time. Now, let's see if we can get back this. Oh, I'm going to be very unhappy if I can't show you the last card. It's morning oh. in Decaturville, Tennessee. <laughs> But for 650 people who once worked here, there are no jobs. The Decaturville Sportswear Factory closed and moved overseas. We were just spamming. It was a good place to work. It just hurt. Um, That's uh, right, John. It didn't have to happen. As 60 Minutes reported, the Bush administration used your tax dollars to lure this sportswear factory to move to El Salvador. Tax incentives, low interest loans, that sign means nothing, really. Not if the government's going to take it away from you. Buy a maid in the USA? How can I buy a maid in the USA when I'm drawing unemployment? We're buying it for 27 years. In the last four years, we've lost tens of thousands of textile jobs, many here in the South. George Bush is using your tax dollars to help make it happen. Clinton Gore, ready to invest in America. Clinton's morning in the Bay of It's okay. We're going to pause it. We'll pause it. All right. I do want you to see this because it's a wonderful juxtaposition. Here, there are no jobs. The Decaturville Sportswear Factory closed and moved overseas. We were just spamming. It was a good place to work. It just hurt from down to the heart. It didn't have to happen. As 60 Minutes reported, the Bush administration used your tax dollars to lure this sportswear factory to move to El Salvador. Tax incentives, low interest loans, that sign means nothing, really. Not if the government's going to take it away from you. Buy a maid in the USA? How can I buy a maid in the USA when I'm drawing unemployment? We're buying 27 years. In the last four years, we've lost tens of thousands of textile jobs, many here in the South. George Bush is using your tax dollars to help make it happen. Clinton Gore, ready to invest in America. Clinton Gore, for people, for a change. One of the ways that's so smart in reworking the Reagan 1984 commercial is that it takes statements such as made in the USA or pride in the USA and subverts them because of the voiceover provided by the people in the commercial. So this is an example of how media starts to turn in on itself. So that this is a commercial that deliberately refers back to one of the most famous commercials of the 1980s and reworks it. So it's media referencing media which is something that we're tending to see more and more today. Now, for our final commercial, we have to come back to something contemporary, and really a day cannot go by without looking at the one that's getting all the attention now. Um, those of you who haven't seen it, here is your chance. Now, this is an absolutely fascinating example. Let me talk about why. Peter was kind enough to mention that um, I've looked at polling in Hollywood, which are two things we don't often put together. The, the contemporary equivalent for the election of 2012 is tweeting. Um, you may be reading about the number of people who were tweeting um, during uh, the debates and also during the conventions. Many of us might think that our classes tweet all the time. And in fact, when I said, let's tweet during the conventions, nobody wanted to, nobody did, they weren't interested. We can require it, but I haven't gone there yet. They are staying to each other but they're not so much tweeting. However, most of America is tweeting. And so you have a read through Twitter of what parts of the debate, this is the first presidential debate, are evoking the most response. What I find interesting about this is how it varies. For example, the absolute peak over there, um, two peaks really, is um, 951 is the peak over there. So it's this first peak. Discussion of Medicare. Now, you would hope that that peaks attention. You would hope that. But the other peak is Jim Lehrer quipping, let's not, and Obama at 10.01 saying the I had five seconds. So as far as awakening responses, they're on par with discussions of Medicaid. 
So we have sort of empirical evidence of the shifting attention um, of the American voter. But one of the other peaks is, let's see, where is it? 934, the Big Bird reference. Um, so this was an indication to the Democratic Party that here was something that people were paying attention to. And as you know, it played out in interesting ways. The um, Free Press of Detroit actually did a summary of how this was playing out um, in, the, in the media. Not so much Governor Romney's statement itself, but the reaction to it. That on that evening, the phrase Big Bird was tweeted 17,000 times. The next day, Facebook said that mentions of Big Bird had increased 800,000 per cent on its network. By Monday morning, a Google News search on Big Bird returned more than 939,000 hits. Now, the question with this is, is this a distraction? Or is this a commercial or an event that's getting at something fundamental in the election? For those of you who haven't seen it, you have to, because this commercial is hilarious. Now, I hope you get it. Oh. All right. We're going to do it on a safari, and we'll work on that. It's a wonderful commercial. Just wonderful. Uh, we'll get it. <laughs> now you actually have to see it, because it is truly hysterical. You do not want her. But. nominee for winner of the election. This is absolutely it. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that. Now, as you know, PBS and, and the Children's Workshop that produces Sesame Street is objecting to this because they don't want Big Bird to be politicized. And for equal time, um, Governor Romney's campaign came out with a campaign count, uses the count from Sesame Street, that keeps track of what serious issues are being mentioned. So. Big Bird eight times, Elmo five times, in the debate Libya zero, plans to fix the economy zero. I wanted to end with this because I think it exemplifies some of the points that we want to remember about commercials. I think we've seen the different ways that they work with sound and images and the juxtaposition of images and sound to create meanings in a very compressed environment. And we've seen how they can either directly or indirectly reference issues that are significant at the time and that whose significance might get lost when we look at them in the future unless we remember or experience the context in which those commercials develop. But one of the other most important things to think about with commercials is to what extent are they giving us understanding about the candidates or the issues that they confront and to what extent are they distracting us, entertaining us, or are they entertaining us by getting at something significant? In looking at the, the Sesame Street Big Bird commercial, would you describe that, and I think this is an open question, as distracting entertainment or getting at something significant? What's your sense looking at that? <laughs> you think it's distracting entertainment. This is interesting. Does anybody think that it's um, getting at something significant? Yes, okay, what's it getting at? Okay, so where federal money was going, you probably saw the debate so that you saw the, the broader context in which this happened. It raises the question of how money is being spent, um, whether people consider this worthy of spending. Um, PBS talked about how the actual spending is one one hundredth of a percent, I think, so it's actually a very small amount. Um, but this is an illustration of how a commercial that's even entertaining or simple can point to a much broader issue. In that sense, I would argue that we can see parallels between Big Bird and the bear 
in terms of the way that they are opening a door onto much bigger issues. This is much more distracting and entertaining, as you noted, than the bear. I don't think there's anything ominous of the bear. And in fact, the commercial plays on the fact that he's not ominous. But it still is like the bear in its strategy in the way that it opens the door to much bigger issues. Um, you've seen a number of websites um, where these commercials are gathered. One of my favorites is called The Living Room Candidate, which was uh, developed at Stanford. And there are links down the side for commercials from 1952 to 2012. There's also the 32nd Candidate from PBS, the Museum of the Moving Image in New York, and the Museum of Broadcasting in New York have very good um, sites for campaign commercials. And if there's a particular commercial you're looking for, as, as I did when Firefox acted up, um, you can always go to YouTube. Most of them are on there as well. So there's no shortage of opportunities to watch these commercials. And I hope after the game, when you're tired of football, if that's possible at all, you'll decide to relax tonight by revisiting some old favorites. So thank you very much for being here today. It was nice to talk with you. Thank you.